Okay, we start off from the left-hand side here. Okay, we start off from this portion here. And I know that this carbon is chiral, attached to four different things, CH3, hydrogen, bromine, and OH. And if we are asked to show the optical isomers, I think it shouldn't be a problem. Of course, we can draw both optical isomers quite easily. And we uh, should be able to show that they are mirror images of each other using the 3D bond. A solid triangle is pointing towards you, the other triangle is pointing away from you. And let's say uh, the isomer on the left-hand side, this is the plus isomer. And what this guy can do is he can rotate light clockwise, plane polarized light clockwise. The other guy on the right-hand side, this will be the minus isomer. This will rotate plane polarized light but counter clockwise. Let's say the optical activity for this guy is 10 degree clockwise. The other guy, which is the mirror image of this guy, will be the evil twin brother uh, of this Whatever he do, I will do same extent, but opposite direction. If he can rotate like 10 degree clockwise, I will rotate like 10 degree, but counter clockwise, right? So this will be the difference between these two. Optical activity, same extent, but opposite direction. Now in syllabus, the combination of these two optical isomers that we encounter are the highlighted portion, the pure sample and the racemic mixture. But I think it's good to know different permutations of it uh, because it completes the picture a lot better. So let us talk about it part by part. If let's say I have a 100% plus isomer, 0% minus isomer, obviously this will just be the plus isomer. So therefore the optical activity will follow the plus isomer. The optical activity will be 10 degree clockwise. All right. If I have the other extreme, 0% plus isomer, 100% minus isomer, then it will be just the minus isomer optical activity will follow this minus isomer, it will be 10 degree counterclockwise. We ignore the SN1, SN2 first. We look at the optical activity of this mixture first. Now, of course, we have this special mixture, 50% of the plus isomer and 50% of the minus isomer, where they will cancel out each other's optical activity. I have half of this plus isomer to rotate like clockwise, half of this minus isomer to rotate like counterclockwise. So cancel out each other. Overall, this guy will be racemic. Optical activity is zero. And this is our racemic mixture. And in syllabus, we actually, uh, when we consider the mechanism, we actually uh, apply this idea quite extensively when we do nucleophilic substitution, uh, depending on SN1, SN2 mechanism, which we will talk about in a while. But you notice, this idea of understanding the mixture involving our optical isomers is very restrictive, very rigid, uh, only 100%, 0%, 0%, 100%, 50%, 50%. How about other possibilities? Can it be 80, 20%? Can it be another combination? And is it possible for me to form different permutations of plus, my, plus isomer and minus isomer. Can I form a non racemic mixture? Actually, the answer is yes. Uh, huh? We can do that. And we want to talk about it eventually. But we want to appreciate that I can have other permutations, other mixtures involving the plus and minus isomer. And I can actually understand the overall optical activity, depending on which one is the majority. So if let's say I have this guy here, 80% plus 20% minus the overall optical activity should follow the majority, correct? I'll have majority plus isomer. So we would expect the optical activity overall should be clockwise because I have majority plus isomer, but the magnitude of it should be less than the pure sample. Pure sample, if it is 10 degree clockwise, if it is majority plus isomer, but it is not 100%, then we would expect the rotation of the plane polarized line will be clockwise, but it will be less than 10 degree. Then conversely, if it's the other way around, if I have majority minus isomer, 70% minus 30% plus isomer, then we would expect overall optical activity to be counterclockwise because it will follow the majority, the minus isomer, but the magnitude will be less than 10 degree counterclockwise. Should be okay. Huh? It's actually quite easy for us to understand. Then you notice this whole thing becomes a entire spectrum from 10% plus isomer, 0% minus isomer, then we gradually decrease the percentage of the plus isomer, gradually increase the percentage of the minus isomer, and then we consider all the possible permutation all the way to 100% minus isomer and no plus isomer. I think this will complete the idea or the concept involving optical isomerism a lot better. 
I think we need to have this concept. Now, again, if I try to apply this to SN1, SN2 mechanism, because we do explicitly talk about it, the difference between SN1, SN2 mechanism, one of it will give me a optically pure sample, one of it, one of it will give me a racemic mixture. And if I try to apply this and I explain under what circumstances will I get a non racemic mixture, so let's establish what we learn in syllabus. In syllabus, if the mechanism goes by SN2 mechanism, then I'll get a pure sample. I'll get 100% plus isoma or 100% minus isoma. So um, if it is SN2 mechanism, I'll get a pure sample, 10 degree clockwise or 10 degree counterclockwise. If the mechanism goes by SN1, remember the carbocation ion flat equally exposed can be attacked from both sides to equal extent, I'll get a racemic mixture which is optically inactive. So SN1 mechanism, then I'll get a, a racemic mixture, optically inactive. Now, if I have a non-racemic mixture and the optical activity of the reaction mixture is uh, less than 10 degree clockwise or counterclockwise, then I know that the mechanism that causes this non-racemic mixture or forms this non-racemic mixture will be SN1 plus SN2 mechanism. And we want to understand or we want to explain why can there be this SN1 plus SN2 mechanism? The idea is actually very simple. Now, if I have two pathways on SN1 or SN2, what makes the reaction go only by SN1 and not by SN2? It must be SN1 path is a lot easier than SN2. That means one pathway is significantly easier than the other one then all the reactants will go by the easier path. So if SN1 is significantly easier, everybody will go by SN1. Nobody will go by SN2, correct? Conversely, if SN2 is easier, then everybody will go by SN2. Nobody will go by SN1. So if the difference in one mechanism, SN1 versus SN2, if one of it is significantly easier than the other guy or more likely to happen than the other guy, then all the reactants will just go by one of the path. The other one will be totally ignored. But we do have instances where both SN1 and SN2 in terms of the difficulty is actually roughly the same. Maybe one guy is significant, what maybe one guy is easier, but it's just significantly easier than the other one. Then you notice huh, what will happen is okay, some of them will go by SN1, some of them will go by SN2. Depending on which one is easier, then we have more of the guy that goes the easier path. Maybe a majority, maybe SN1 is slightly easier than SN2. Maybe we have like 60% SN1, 40% SN2, or maybe like 70% SN1, 30% SN2. Uh, so if I have a mixture of SN1 and SN2, it means that these two pathways, the difference in the difficulty will start to become smaller and smaller. Then we will start to have mixture of SN1 plus SN2 uh, mechanism. So this example that I have here is very, very simplistic. I assume that this is 50% SN1, 50% SN2, just to show you that a mixture of SN1 plus SN2 mechanism can give me a non racemic mixture. So 50% SN1, 50% SN2 means that both pathways are equally likely, correct? Uh, it just means that there's no difference in path number one and path number two. So half of it will go by SN1, half of it will go by SN2. It makes the discussion a lot easier, but uh, do keep in mind, even if I change the permutation, let's say 60% SN1 or 70% SN1 or 80% SN1, the outcome will still be the same. I can show that this is a non racemic mixture. So we use 50%, 50%, it is easier. Now, 50% SN1, I know that SN1 will give me a racemic mixture. So half of the reactant goes by SN1, it will give me a racemic mixture, 25%. Will be a plus isomer. So I just write plus B as the uh, product. Plus isomer, 25% of it will give me a minus isomer. Because remember, SN1 will give me a racemic mixture. 50% of it will give me in total 50%. Half of it is plus, half of it is minus. So 25% plus, 25% minus. The other 50% will go by SN2 mechanism. And I know that I'll get a pure sample. I can get either 50% of the plus isomer or 50% of the minus isomer. It doesn't matter, lah. can be plus, can be minus, but it has to be a pure sample. Half of it, if it goes by SN2, will give me 50% of either plus or minus. So if these are all the products that are being formed, if I add everything together in this case, you notice I'll have 75% plus isomer, 25% minus isomer. So this will be my non racemic mixture. Expected optical activity for this guy, since I have majority plus isomer, we would expect this to rotate like clockwise 
overall, but the magnitude of it will be less than the pure sample. If let's say my pure sample, it is a plus, uh, plus 10 or rather 10 degree clockwise, I know that in this case, the overall activity, the direction will be clockwise because majority it is a plus isomer, but magnitude of it will be less than 10 in terms of the magnitude, but overall this will be clockwise. Okay? So involving non rhythmic mixture, this is a very, very simple example. As mentioned, I think it's good to keep this in mind. In questions, if we encounter the optical activity of a species, uh, which is uh, smaller than the pure sample, then we know that the, uh, the reason why I have this optical activity is because of a non rhythmic mixture. And in the case of nucleophilic substitution, a combination of SN1 and SN2 mechanism will give me this non rhythmic mixture.